Hello listeners and welcome to another episode of Love is Everywhere the podcast, the show where I give comedians assignments of things that are supposed to make you happier and then we talk about it and we find out how it went. Today's episode is Isabel Zlatan. Oh my goodness. Guys, I know we've been on a hot streak here and I've been saying that every episode is great, but come on. Have I been wrong? I don't think so. This episode's amazing. <laughs> Her assignment was uh, all about connecting with people who you feel really appreciate you and really see you. You know, like somebody who really gets you. Um, and man, wh- so appropriately, I felt so seen in this conversation with Isabel. This was such a wonderful conversation. Uh, we talk about um, self-esteem, self-image, uh, feeling like an outsider, uh, growing up poor. It was just like uh, such a good, such a good chat with my pal Isabel. Um, if you don't know her work already, she's fantastically hilarious and absolutely somebody who you should follow on all social media things. Uh, man, like she's really got all bases covered. She's super funny, super talented writer. So you can follow her on Twitter at Isabel Zotin, uh, Z-A-W-T-U-N. Um, but she's also a total babe, super fashionista, one of the w- most well-dressed people I think I have ever met in my life. <clears throat> Excuse me. So go and follow her on Instagram as well, um, at Isabel Zotin. Same handle. Well, if you're following her on one, go follow her on the other. <laughs> and <laughs> in the meantime, please enjoy this conversation with Isabel Zotin. Isabel. <laughs> nice to see you. It's so nice, nice to, to see, see you. Anybody right now? I know. Very <laughs> much. Uh, we start with an honest, how are you? So how are you for real? Um, very emotional lately. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that it might be, it might be a common thing. Um, it might just be, I think, months of like buildup of yeah. the overall stress of the world. But I'm finding now um, especially this past week, I've really had to shelter myself from any bad news because I found that I would be like at work scrolling, even things like Reddit, um, mm-hmm. which aren't necessarily news focused, but just anything negative, I would just cry. Yep. Immediately. So I feel like now more than ever, I'm really on like a hairpin trigger for tears. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think you're alone in that. I think that a lot of people are probably feeling that way. And I think you're right when you say, like, it's a buildup. Like, we've absorbed so much. It's this, mm-hmm. like, big collective trauma. Yep. And we've had months and months and months of, like, just coping and surviving and mm-hmm. trying to handle the amount of overwhelm that we've all had. So I think we're all, like, at capacity right now. <laughs> our, our cups overflow. If it's like Exactly. When uh, last week... I don't know when this is going to come out, but for people listening, um, a couple of days ago was the explosion in Beirut. Mm-hmm. And I, I just like watching footage of the explosion was okay. But any, so the minute there was audio of a person being like, look out, I was like, ah! and I had yeah. to just, cause I couldn't, and I was like, okay, this is it from now on. It's just, uh, like videos of cute cows. Mm-hmm. That's, and then I'm logging off. Have you seen the video of uh, the cow lying down on the woman's stomach? Uh, I. It's this like beautiful white cow, and uh, they it basically just takes a nap on this lady, and it's adorable. <laughs> I started looking up cow videos specifically because one of my coworkers loves cows. She just loves them, and so when she would wander up to me. Um, like to chat during breaks. I would try to always have a cow video queued up to be like, I'm mm-hmm. gonna show you. So now I feel like I've seen, like if there's a cow video, I'm on it. <laughs> they're so snuggly. They love just like snuggling up to their owner. Yeah, they love people and they're like, yeah, super social. Like cows are very sweet. Mm-hmm. I think you're really smart to clock what's setting you off and then try and limit it. I think that we could all stand to do a little bit more of that of like, yeah, edit down what you're actually looking at on social media. And if you're noticing that the news is having a really overwhelming effect on you right now, it's better to just take a break. Like, yeah. and, um, and I've had to tell my husband, uh, what, sometimes he'll come at me with a headline and I'll be like, 
is there a petition I can sign or a con GoFundMe I can contribute to? If not, if I can't do anything about it, don't talk to me about it. Like, mm -hmm. I, it sounds so callous, but like, if it's something about that, like, I can personally have change, an impact. Yeah. Then, like, tell me about it. Let's like, I'll open up my PayPal. We don't have a lot of money, but I'll send my $10 to that bail fund or like to that, you know, surgery mm -hmm. fund. But if it's something about like North Korea, I can't, I can't do anything. So it's just like, yeah, I have to, you're again, better, you're better for the world being able to cope than you are overwhelming yourself so that you can feel well informed. Yeah. And I've, I still feel, I feel guilty when I describe it to other people, but I also have stopped feeling guilty about it for me. Cause I'm like, I'm feeling guilty about what, that I can't save yes. North Korea. <laughs> that, that just makes me seem like I'm so pompous that I have this God complex where I'm like, well, I could, I could talk some sense into Kim Jong-il. So <laughs> no, I, although I'm confident that if you got him in a room, you probably could do some, some work. But <laughs> I mean, I don't speak Korean. So I think that <laughs> a lot of miming, I might accidentally offend him in some there way. There are some obstacles. There are some yeah. obstacles for sure. <laughs> <laughs> what is the food that he really likes? Is it like cheese where he's like obsessed with cheese? I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, something like that. Maybe I could give him a wheel of cheese. <laughs> Canada has great cheese. Yeah, I'll give him some Hav Havarti. That's a Canadian yeah. cheese. <laughs> I know that from a commercial that I saw about a little boy buying Havarti and it was like Canada, Canadian cheese. <laughs> Should we get into your assignment? Yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, so the assignment that I gave you was that I wanted you to take some time, sit down, and think and focus in on a person in your life who you feel really sees you. Somebody who really loves and accepts you for exactly who you are, who you feel you don't have to explain yourself to, uh, who just kind of gets it. And then if you felt comfortable to tell that person in detail why you love and appreciate them and thank them for seeing you. Uh, so tell us about what that was like. Okay. Um, well, as soon as you said it, I had a person in mind right away. Actually, I consider myself very lucky because I had at least three or four in, in mind. I realized that, that that's a lot of awesome people to have in my life. But I found that my own self-doubt was kind of pulling me back. Because mm -hmm. I was like, do they really see me? Or do they just like see the best version of me? that I put forward. And then I was like, hmm, maybe I need someone who's like a little bit meaner to me or like <laughs> calls me out a bit more. Cause um, I feel like to, to feel seen, you also have to have a good like self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I worry too much that I'm like so ego egotistical and I just think I'm the greatest person ever who has no faults. And so I'm like, oh, this person, yeah, they totally get me. They know that I'm amazing and I'm yeah. perfect. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I spent a couple of days um, just thinking about that. And then I realized, oh, this is probably just my, I don't want to, RuPaul has ruined my brain because now <laughs> I call my inner saboteur. I hate yeah. that term, but I don't know what else to use. Um, yeah, I, I don't want that negative part of me to determine how I interpret my friendships. Mm -hmm. If my friends think I'm great, then maybe I'm great. I don't know. Um, so uh, it was, it was a, it was like a, uh, in the end, it was like a three-way tie between my husband and my mom and my best friend, uh, Nick Cassandra. Mm -hmm. In the end, um, I ended up going with, uh, with my friend Cassandra, even though my husband and my mom are, are great we're great contenders, but I think it's because, um, I mean, of my mom, I shouldn't say I've known her the longest because obviously, I've <laughs> known her the longest. but I think that, um, my mom, I was hesitant because I feel like she, uh, because she's a mom, she falls into that, that first worry where it's like, maybe she sees me in too good. Yeah. Like a through day. a mom filter. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, she loves me too much. So that disqualifies her. And <laughs> We've also talked about this too, about how she's like sometimes um, in life, uh, and, and I love my mom and I love these conversations that I'm able to have with her where we're both like reflecting on our journey as a mother and daughter, where she's like, um, sometimes I find myself beating myself up because I feel like I didn't prepare you enough for life, but 
I just had this view of you. Like I always thought you were more mature and more wise than you actually were, um, you know, because of the, the mom lens or whatever. Mm -hmm. So again, I love my mom and she's the best. Uh, but I was like, maybe she's too, she looks at me too much with rose colored glasses, which is, it's nice to have someone like that in your life. For Absolutely. Sure. But I think that, yeah, you're right. That there's a difference between appreciating a parent for seeing you and loving you unconditionally. And then when you find that kind of thing with a friend, it's mm -hmm. all the more special because this is a chosen person. This person owes you nothing, has no obligation to you, isn't family and is still able to see you in a kind of familial way. Yeah. And I do think that with parents, sometimes we, like, I know the things that I worry about with my kids, sometimes I'm worrying about young me mm -hmm. and not necessarily my kid, because you see your, um, I don't want to say failings because that's not correct, but you see your weaknesses in your kid. And so you think you know them because you know you at that age, but your kid's weakness is slightly different. Like it's, it's not mm. quite yours. So sometimes in my life, my mom would like predict something that I would do. And I was like, oh, my mom can read my mind, but really it was just like, <laughs> no, my mom and I are very similar in certain ways. So she's able to predict the behavior mm -hmm. that way. But again, it's something that I figured out from conversations with her. So we're, we're learning and growing together. Yeah. But uh, ultimately I chose my, my best friend because I've known her longer than my husband. I feel like with both of those people, my husband and my friend, we've had like deep conversations, but just because she's got like time on her side, I've had more of those deep conversations with my friend. Mm -hmm. And I do find that um, a, like a, a friendship with someone who you have the same gender identity with um, is very valuable because you have that shared experience. Yeah, I was about to say like the power of female friendship mm -hmm. is so great. Yeah, exactly. Do you remember, I don't know if you, it was a moment for you, but for me, it was like a, it was a full on like moment, an eye opening moment where I realized, oh, I can be, I can be friends with women and not be jealous of them. Yep. Or feel like I have to be them or be better than them. And I, it was so freeing. I was like, wow, well, my life is about to get a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel like, especially the female friendships that I've cultivated in adulthood are mm -hmm. like so rich and so special and so much more rooted in like positivity and mutual support yeah. and exactly. particularly I try to like surround myself with women who are also caretaking personalities like I am mm. I can easily find myself in these sort of one-sided friendships where like I'm wanting to take care of the other person and l listen to and support the other person but they're not necessarily giving me an equal amount back and that's absolutely no fault in those people it's just that like I also need to make sure that I have friends who are like are you okay are you like drinking enough water like <laughs> taking care of me as well <laughs> no exactly it's so interesting how as we get older and the more we know ourselves uh the better that our friendships become mm -hmm. I've there have been a couple times in my life where I've met someone and I've been like oh you're so great and you're wonderful and I'll always have a high opinion of you but like we we probably can't be friends yeah I've never said that obviously but you just kind of know where you're like, this person will be an acquaintance mm -hmm. who, who I'll hold in high esteem. And then you meet people who you really like fall in friend love with mm -hmm. and who, you know, pretty quickly. It's sort of like love in that way, like even like romantic love where, oh, you know, in your gut, like first conversation, you're like, yeah, OK, like we speak the same language. Like we're oh. definitely going to be friends. I definitely think that that I would qualify that as a love at first sight. Mm -hmm. For sure, I've had that I, with like female friends these three times where you just look at each other and you both know, oh, we're going to be friends. Like, yeah. one, I remember one was at a university orientation where we were all sitting in a big brown circle. And I remember seeing my friend who I'm still friends with this person. And she made some sort of like a dry, witty comment when the white um, RA was making a comment about pronouncing her name or something. And I remember looking at her <laughs> eye contact and I was like, we're going to be friends. Yeah. <laughs> So tell yes. me about your friend Cassandra. Well, we met in art school, which was, um, I'm going to say objectively the, the best, but also most challenging time of my life mm -hmm. um, for reasons that I'll get into some of them, but not all of them. That's um, fine. One was uh, I had just come out of doing um, like a bachelor's and a bachelor of education at a school 
that wasn't for me, doing a program that wasn't for me, and trying so hard to like fit in with a with a school culture mm -hmm. that didn't fit my personality. And then when I went to art school, I was like, oh, this, I I can't excel it at school because I, this is where I should have been. Yeah. So it was really a lovely time for me in that way. Um, and then it was the most challenging because I was, so I was 24 and I had two kids and I was escaping the, my relationship with their dad, mm -hmm. which involved like restraining orders and things like that. So um, for that reason, it was also a, an amazing time because I was like experiencing freedom. Yeah. <laughs> Ever. But also really challenging because I was like, okay, like I'm on my own. I have to support myself financially while being in school and mm -hmm. learning all this. So I have, um, it's funny, I, I have a story that I guess now that I've mentioned it, I have to tell it, but um, <laughs> like, I can't mention it without getting teary eyed. And I real cause, so I'll, I'll tell you the story and then I'll explain. Sorry. You wouldn't speak. be the, you wouldn't be the first person to get teary on this podcast. So if that <laughs> happens, don't feel bad. Also, I warned everyone at the beginning. I was like, listen, I'm crying a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing you said, you're like, how are you? And I was like, well, I'm uh, very emotional. So, um, <laughs> Also, I apologize for saying um so much. I haven't spoken to another person in so long. Stop. No, this is not the podcast to apologize on. <laughs> Thank you for your patience and listening to my many ums and ahs. I That's really a much better way of putting it. Yeah. Yes, you're not supposed to apologize. You're supposed to thank people. You don't yeah. say, I'm sorry I'm late. You say, thank you for your patience. Exactly. We've been in therapy. We know that. Yeah. <laughs> so right when I first escaped, it was around Christmas time. And because I was very poor, I had a free lawyer and the free lawyer I had was not great. And I knew he was not great for my first meeting with him, but legal aid makes it very clear that once you've selected a lawyer, if you want to change lawyers, it's a whole complicated process. Yeah. And I, it had taken so long for me to just get a meeting with someone because when you're approved for legal aid. They give you this long document with a long list of lawyers. Like it's five pages. There are like a hundred lawyers in each page. And I was looking through and I was trying to find female names and I was calling and I was getting a lot of, Oh, we're not accepting legal aid right now. We're not accepting legal aid right now. So then the first, I just was like, okay, I'm going to go alphabetically. And the first person I found where the person was like, we are accepting legal aid. I was like, okay, thank goodness. Uh, so basically I went with the first person who told me yes, which, mm -hmm maybe that was a red flag. I don't know, but I was so exhausted. I didn't have the energy to switch lawyers. So basically I had this terrible lawyer. Um, and I'm not saying that as someone who's biased, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but objectively I know he was terrible because years later when I got another legal aid lawyer who was referred to me by the Barbara Schlafer clinic, mm -hmm. who was very good, she looked at the agreement that the previous lawyer had drafted up and said, you could sue this person <laughs> because they were such a bad lawyer. Oh, basically. good. Oh, good. So good. I didn't end up suing him because I had neither the time nor the mental energy. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't want to see him or deal with him again. But it was very validating to have a professional look at that and be like, oh, every misgiving you had about this person, right on the money. It was right yeah. on the money. So I went in to court with this terrible lawyer and I was dealing with a judge who was saying things like okay so like so he tried to kill himself when he had the children but also she had postpartum depression so she's also crazy oh so we can't my god yeah it was it was so bad I that's one of the things that really stuck with me was me saying like I'm concerned because this person is like unstable when they have young children in the home with them yeah. and then I was told Oh, but you would postpartum depression, so you're crazy. Um, it's insane the like the disparity between how we weigh things between the sexes. Like to look at at something like uh like postpartum depression and putting it at the same level. That's an insane to me. I yeah. am so angry for you right now. It was so and. Just the way that the legal system treats mental illness in general, I think mm -hmm. is really, and I've spoken to other friends who are lawyers since, um, and it's one of the many things that I bring up 
is the way that this was discussed and they all agree yeah the like legally the court system is like years behind when it comes to a proper understanding of mental illness and how it affects people and families and behavior and criminal behavior mm -hmm. just just bonkers but at the end of the day um he he came from a wealthy family he made more money than me and he was like okay she can have like she can have more time with the kids um she can keep the apartment i just want all the stuff like i want all the furniture i remember i had to really argue for me to keep my children's beds because i was like you're gonna you're gonna have your kids you're gonna say okay the kids can stay with you but they can't have a bed mm -hmm. it's crazy so all like all the furniture was gone tables chairs couches um, I was sleeping on like an army cot for a couple of months mm -hmm. and the, like the only furniture in my entire apartment were my kids beds <laughs> and then around Christmas time um, it was boxing day for boxing day sales my parents were like okay we're gonna we're gonna help out a little bit and I had a little bit of money that I've been saving up so we went out for the boxing day sales and got like table chairs I got like a little play tent from like the ones from Ikea that are shaped mm -hmm. like a circus tent and some just enough stuff that it didn't feel like you know when you're in an empty house in your movie you and go like hello and you can hear the echo yeah. so, okay we're gonna make it feel more like a house and then when I brought my kids into the the house um because they'd been staying with my parents while I set up and my daughter was two two years old and she walks into the house and she looks around and she went oh Santa brought us furniture. Oh my god. That's so cute. It was like she was she was so happy and I'm tearing up again. Yeah. Like she was so happy and she was like, oh my gosh, it was Santa. And uh I didn't correct her. <laughs> Cause it's beautiful. But, like it's a tiny and, miracle for her. Yeah. And it just like that made her Christmas because they didn't yeah. they weren't able to get a lot of presents that year. And she was like, This is why we didn't get as many toys, because Santa was like bringing us a couch. That's beautiful. <laughs> and I love like a child being able to appreciate that. Like to look around the home and be like, This is all I need for Christmas. Like yeah. it was it was Oh basic. my god, that's so beautiful. <laughs> Oh, also, I forgot, this was the year that we had the really bad power outage. Oh, yeah. And it was like, people had no heat. <laughs> it was like, that, but that was, like my, at that point in my life, that was my happiest Christmas. Because even though, like, our house was, like, barren, cold floors, and, like, frost everywhere, I was like, this is the first year we can have a Christmas tree. Yeah. So anyway, how this all ties into my friend, this long tangent. Oh, what I wanted to say was, the reason that that, story gets me so emotional is because in in that moment of my life I was feeling every emotion simultaneously mm -hmm. and they were all cranked up to 11 like I was as happy as I had ever been but also as sad as I had ever been and I was as like angry as I had ever been while also being as like relieved it was just like yeah my my brain was just like like turning up all the knobs and so it was just like very very overwhelming so I was in this this mental state of just being like I don't know how anyone I wonder how others perceive me at this time because I was just so it like in my own world and whatever um, but that is the time that I met Cassandra and um, she's just a very very understanding and empathetic person and even though I hadn't known her for very long I found myself sharing a lot of details about what was happening with her mm -hmm. and she was able to really empathize with me. And I remember being like, oh, okay, like this person's going to be my friend for, the, for a long time. Yeah. That's beautiful. What do you think? What is, what is it about her and your friendship now that stands out to you as being like one of the primo factors of this friendship and why it's lasted so long? Um, I do think that, both of us express appreciation for the other pretty frequently. That's a good at, one. At first I was worried with the assignment that it would come across as disingenuous, suddenly sending someone a message and being like this for a podcast. <laughs> but, um, but then I was typing it, I, it wasn't very long. Um, but then I realized, oh, like we, we do this pretty frequently where we're just like, listen, I appreciate you so much and blah, blah, blah. I think that really helps a friendship for sure is letting the person know how much they mean to you. 
Absolutely. I 100% agree. And it's good for both of you anytime that you do that, because for on your side of things, it's an exercise in gratitude, right? Mm -hmm. And like sitting and taking a minute to appreciate what a beautiful, special friendship you have with this person and to be grateful for that friendship. Mm -hmm. And then it's also connecting with others, which is like really, really important for if you're looking for ways to boost your happiness, like connecting with other people is numero uno. Um, so you get a little bit of that. And then the other person feels appreciated. Like, I think that a lot of the time we can get really in our heads about expressing ourselves that way and mm -hmm. being really direct about our gratitude for somebody in your life. But like, no one is ever going to be mad <laughs> to hear that. Like <laughs> everybody that loves hearing how great they are. So like, don't be afraid to tell them. <laughs> I think a couple of times I've said, maybe boyfriends or whatever, where I've said it and they've been like, are you dying? What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know about love languages? Yes. What's your, what is your love language? <sighs> Mine is like physical touch and it's the like talking. Yeah. Like wor words of words affirmation. Words of affirmation. Mm -hmm. And I always, I feel like such a, Maybe this is just because of how my weird brain works, but um, I always felt bad that it was, I think now it's more physical touch and words of affirmation, but for a while it was uh, gift giving. Mm -hmm. um, not just from other people, but I love giving people gifts as well. And I was like, man, why are my love languages like the most superficial ones? <laughs> like, I love you, here's a present. <laughs> and I felt somehow like the the quality time one, I was like, man, those people, like, they're the elite mm -hmm. love people. Or, <laughs> or it's like the ones where it's um, acts of service. I was like, here I am this lazy person just being like, I love you. And then this other person's actually getting off their butt and doing things. <laughs> yeah, I can 100% relate to this of like, yeah, you have to get out of your head about if you're a gifts number one person, like, that is not a superficial thing. It's, uh, if anything, like the people that I know who are gifts people, it's more like maybe it's not so easy for them to communicate themselves with words. Like maybe it's not easy for them to tell you in language how much they care and appreciate you, mm -hmm. but they can remember something that you mentioned six months ago and get you some kind of gift related to that thing that's so tailored to you. Yeah. So it's extremely thoughtful and still mm -hmm. like a very beautiful way to express your love for other people. <laughs> so for any gifts listeners, <laughs> you're doing fine. <laughs> oh yeah, you're great. And like I said, that was from my own experience. Where I was like, well, I like getting gifts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no need to feel bad about that. <laughs> so did you get a response from Cassandra about uh, your expression of gratitude for her? Oh yeah, immediately. And it was the same thing being like, I'm always here for you. I love and appreciate you as well. And I was like, man, I'm so lucky to have this lovely person in my life. Yeah, you are. And you're lucky that when you thought about this assignment that you had multiple people come to your mind right away. That's wonderful. And yeah, people, I, I love that your like your list of at least those three um, occupy different spaces in your life too, right? Like you've got your romantic relationship with your husband and then you've got a familial relationship with your mom. And then you have this friendship with Cassandra. And I think it's beautiful that you have somebody who really sees you in all of those different categories in your life. So that's very blessed. Yeah, I, I'm really glad for this assignment. Because like I said, with this, the way this year has kind of gone, I've, mm -hmm. I have a tendency to be down in the dumps. And especially this year, I've been kind of down in the dumps. And even just that realization of like, oh, I have a, like a bevy of people to pick from in terms of people who I love very much and I know love me, I was like, well, I'm, I'm extremely lucky. That's a, a really important thing to take stock of too, is like, if you're lucky enough to have people like that in your life, like you have to take some time to really focus on that and how wonderful and beautiful and special of a thing that is. Yeah. Especially in adulthood, like it's hard to make new friends as an adult. Oh yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you have good friendships, like, tell those people you love them. <laughs> exactly. 100%. I'm all about that. Is there, um, are there any friendships, uh, new friendships in, I would say, 
less than two years old that you see potential for in terms uh, of like a, a relationship like with Cassandra? There are a lot of people I've met in the last two years who are super awesome and I wish I could hang out with more. Mm -hmm. um, I think that my friendship with Cassandra was really facilitated by the fact that we met when we were in school. So we had that class time together. And mm -hmm. then when I started doing comedy, she started doing it too. And so we would go at least like weekly to an open mic or something. She doesn't do comedy anymore, but um, for me as a, because I I'm married now, but I only that only happened this year. So, um, I found like single parented made it kind of hard to foster adult friendships. Of course, was, you like oh, so, yeah, you, very sorry. little time, very yeah. little time, very little extra energy to give mm -hmm. to other people. One hundred percent. Yeah. So there are, and again, I am a. Uh, this is me getting in my head about it. And there are like, there are so many people who spring to mind where I'm like, there's this cool person and that cool person. Um, but a lot of the times it's like conversations over social media. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm like, I think I'm their friend, but do they think I'm their friend? Or <laughs> they like that's that weird girl who always responds to my Instagram stories. <laughs> I don't know which one it is. It seems like you have a lot of doubt when they <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. I I know it, and this definitely comes from. Um, so, my my parents are n not the same race, and my mom is uh, she's Métis, she's Indigenous, and when I was little, we lived in a tiny, tiny little town that was all Métis people. But it was like my parents moved there with us, and mm -hmm. if you move to a small town and like you're new to the small town, it's so hard to fit in. Yeah. And if, you, um, if you're an indigenous person, you marry a non-indigenous person. I, this is not the case for everywhere in the world, obviously, but in Northern Alberta, um, there's like a saying, uh, marry out, get out, where basically like you marry a non-native person, you can hit the road. So mm -hmm. um, my siblings and I were very obviously, like you could just see from looking at us that we didn't like match. Uh, with the other kids in our community, which isn't to say that we didn't make friends, but it was always like we were tighter with our group of siblings than we were with the other people around us. And then when we moved, first we moved to London, Ontario, which was a huge culture shock. That would have been a drastic change. I remember sitting in class and like counting the blonde kids mm -hmm. because I'd only ever seen a blonde person on TV. And I was like, I feel like I'm in a movie. <laughs> there's seven blonde people. Um, but again, there's that very like distinct visual difference. And like at that point, cultural difference as well between me and the other kids. And then when we moved to Toronto, my mom started teaching at this um, private school. And so I was allowed to attend the private school because my mom worked there. But there was a huge like socioeconomic difference between me and the other kids there. Mm. Like... I would go to their house. I remember going to one of my friends' houses and for a sleepover. And when my parents came to pick me up, my little brother walked in the house and yelled at the top of his lungs, oh my gosh, this is a mansion. Yeah. <laughs> and then they would come to our house and be like, why don't you have your own bathroom? Mm -hmm. That's so, you have one bathroom for the whole family? Oh my God, you have to share a room with your sister? And I'm no longer friends with any of those people because we had just like zero in common. So I definitely have a big outsider complex when it comes to any social interaction whatsoever, not helped by the fact that I, for years, was a single mom and just unable mm -hmm. to attend social functions and, like, hangouts and stuff like that. So I'm always double, like, I'm always, uh, what, what do they call it? Now I'm, I'm double. Is double, double consciousness? What's that? Is it double consciousness? The, like, seeing yourself as you're being seen? Yeah. And, and yeah. And, and, uh. It, the word I was looking for was second guessing. I'm always second guessing myself when it comes to other people. Um, because I think that a lot of people who were poor or I've also encountered this with people who were not neurotypical, people who say were um, like have autism, mm -hmm. where they felt like they were treated like a weird pet. Yes. In school. And I really felt that from a lot of my classmates where I was like the weird, the weird pet. 
And there is a point where you realize, oh, like they're, they're laughing at me because like I'm funny, but also we're not equals. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's really stuck with me in adulthood now. I relate to that quite a bit, like Mm -hmm. quite a bit. I also had the experience growing up of being like the one poor kid in a very affluent neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It sucks. Yeah, I grew up with a single mom, and we rented a basement apartment in Markham. Mm -hmm. It was, like, in Markham, like, near Unionville, so it was, like, beautiful big houses. Everybody that I went to school with had, like, the perfect little suburban life with, like, a nice big, like, four-bedroom house and, like, a lawn and a pool and and stuff, and I was just like, you have stairs? (laughs) (laughs) I was like, your floor, your house is multiple floors, (laughs) like... (laughs) And uh, you definitely, like, you, especially as a kid, like, you pick up on everything as a kid, Mm -hmm. right? Like, you're just a sponge for things. So, yeah, like, going over to other people's houses, you realize very quickly, like, oh, I I live a very different life, and my family is very different. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I do think, like, uh, although it has made me feel like a constant and perpetual outsider in every group of people that I'm ever in, even if I do actually belong, uh, it has given me such an appreciation for everything that I have. Oh, absolutely. Now when I, like, when I go to an Airbnb and there's a dishwasher, I'm like, oh, is this, am I a Is this a palace? (laughs) And being able to, like, in the apartment that I have, um, I'm, I should say I'm very lucky with the apartment that I have now, not just as like a former poor person. Well, I am a poor person now, not just as a <laughs> poor person, but um, as like a person living in Toronto, I one of the most expensive cities. I lucked out when I got to my apartment and knowing that my kids have their own rooms is like, that's huge for me. I'm like, I made it. My kids have yeah, their own did. rooms. We still all have to share a bathroom. <laughs> and yeah, but yeah, I'm just, we should meet after this and talk about the experience of being the mm-hmm. one poor kid among all the rich. Cause, cause it was just like, it's such a bizarre. It's so weird. strange. And like people who have not had that experience can't mm-hmm. understand it. It's like living your whole life, like an alien. Yep. <laughs> it's very yeah. much like. <laughs> you go to their house and you're like, what's this? What's that? What do you call yeah. them? Oh, this is a whole new world. Yep. It's really strange. And I still feel like whenever I'm in a really rich neighborhood or at a really nice house or in anywhere where the people in the space have money, I feel like somebody's gonna like a cartoon, like lift me by the back of the pants and throw me out of the door. (laughs) Like, (laughs) I feel like I have to like sneak around and be like, I belong here. Yep. mm -hmm, I Yeah. Or just, like, take up as little space as possible and try to be invisible, which I think is how I coped with things when I was growing up. So now I'm like that now. It takes me a long time, especially if I'm in a group of people. I'm very hesitant to talk. Like, uh, I want to take up as little space as possible. The part of my brain, my inner saboteur, which uh, we'll call Brenda. Uh, (laughs) Brenda... (laughs) Brenda's always piping up being like, oh, everybody's bothered by the fact that you're even here. Like, I, everybody's so annoyed by you, and- Our Brenda's met shit. Possible. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> our Brenda's know each other for sure. Yeah. <laughs> we talk a lot about, um, we talk a lot about how, what it's like to be, say, the only person of color in a space full of white people, or what it's like to be the only queer person mm-hmm. with all straight people, but I think that- um, I would love to hear more dialogue about what it's like to be the only per- poor person in a group of wealthy people. Because I think that I've I've been the only person of color in a white room. Um, I'm I'm not queer. I know that you are, so I'm sure you've had that experience as well. Yep. Um, for me, the thing that's shaped me, I think, the most is that feeling of like being the dirt bag. Yeah. <laughs> and that's something I call myself now with love, you know. But at when at the time when this was being formed I absolutely did not feel that way it's I remember like I could I could sort of uh push it for a while before people would find out Mm -hmm. that I was poor especially because uh so I lived in a basement apartment but if somebody was dropping me off at home like it would look like I just lived in that house 
Mm -hmm. So like I wouldn't invite people over and I just have their parents drop me outside and then I would go around to the side door and go down to mm -hmm. my basement apartment. But I remember being like extraordinarily ashamed of having anybody over to my home. So mm -hmm. I think it also like affects how you socialize and stuff as a kid, right? Because for yeah. me, it meant that I was not spending a lot of time with the other kids outside of school because I was too embarrassed to have them over to my home. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to bring a kid home with me after school to play. I'm just going to go home alone because I don't want anybody to see where I live. Yeah, definitely. I can definitely relate to that. And also the like the social things that people do really do vary based on income like Extremely. you have birthday parties where everyone goes to wonderland okay um how are we gonna do this or when i was um in university and one of the reasons that i'm not friends with any of these people anymore is because i couldn't engage with them in these ways socially where they'd be like for spring break we're all going to cuba and i was yes. like um you can do that <laughs> Oh. I I remember even like uh, a lot of the kids who I went to elementary school with had gone to this one preschool that you had to pay for. Mm -hmm. So they all already knew each other and were already friends and already had their groups before even kindergarten had started. Mm -hmm. So like me walking into my first day of school, like everybody's already buddied up <laughs> and that because their parents could afford to send them to this preschool or like after school programs, right? Like uh, kids take dance classes or gymnastics or they play sports and yeah. uh, I couldn't do any of that stuff. They do dance. Yeah. And the, so they've got all of this extra social time and extra places to meet friends and yeah, very different. This reminds me, this might be a bit of a jump. Um, That's okay, I like jumps. But I was just having a conversation. So my dad is a musician which is part of the reason that my family was poor growing up. But my also, mom's a musician, and that's <laughs> part of the reason we were poor growing up. <laughs> but also gave me many wonderful memories in my childhood, and my dad is the best dad who ever lived and ever was a dad. Um, but uh, so he teaches my children piano, and my son is more athletic than he is creative, so it didn't really stick with him, but my daughter is great at the piano and um we got have like a, a little secondhand keyboard that someone someone gave us in her room and she practices all the time and so I was talking to her and I was like oh if you want we could give you um like proper piano lessons and she was like I want grandpa to keep teaching me because she loves her grandpa yeah and I was like oh well if you go through lessons you get certificates you can put that in your resume I know that it can help you get into universities and then my son who was in the car for this conversation he was like so that must mean if you're rich, it's easier for you to get into university. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh my God. How smart is your son? <laughs> He's the best. I know I say this about everyone in my life. I was like, my mom's the best. And dad's, my dad's the best. It's true. Everyone in my life who's connected to me yes. is, is the best. But I was like, imagine figuring that out when you're like 10 because your mom's talking about piano lessons. And I was like, yeah, of course. Like, the fact that we have all these extracurriculars as bonuses on university applications. Yeah. No wonder rich people get into yep. school. And uh, not to mention from the academic side of things, the luxury of being able to afford a tutor yep. or like, yeah, other services to help your children with their academics. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's so many barriers in the way. Just, mm -hmm. just so many. The, the more I think about, because I, I taught very briefly, um, I don't think I have the right personality to deal, I have the exact right personality to deal with bratty students, but I have the exact wrong personality to deal with other teachers, <laughs> <laughs> is what I found. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so I taught for a little bit, both my parents are now teachers, and I think a lot about education tied to classism, especially now when we're dealing with COVID-19 and you really mm -hmm. see the difference between the way rich children are going to be schooled and poor children are going to be schooled where it's yes. like, you know, the rich kids are going to have tutors and you know, the poor kids are going to be shoved into a classroom yeah. full of, full of sneezing people. Mm -hmm. um, and Even in the, like in the quarantine time, like being able to have a laptop and internet access at home is a barrier. Oh yeah. 
we have like we have one home computer and it'd be like my my son would have to have a video meeting with his class my daughter would have to have a video meeting with her class and it was like i have to use the computer for work yeah so and it, it, that'd be great if you were uh, had three computers in your home yeah they were, that, were yeah. like listen we got to alternate for who can do the video program their class i'm again i'm very lucky because i have my teaching experience mm -hmm. and also um lexa graham another comic who is uh, another one of these people where i'm like i hope she thinks i'm her friend because i think she's a perfect angel and i love her so much she's um, great. But, but because she's like a, a perfect angel um she sent me a lot of worksheets for my kids to work on uh so i had a lot of i was very lucky for the resources that i had but mm -hmm. i was talking to some other moms in my neighborhood and yeah, like there's a lot of struggle involved with just the online learning aspect of it. And, you know, rich people are able to afford tutors and stuff like that during COVID and poor people aren't. Yeah. But what I learned from being a poor kid in a rich school, um, I learned a lot of things uh, that I wasn't, not that I wasn't supposed to learn, I guess, but um, you, you observe certain things and you see that in the education system, grades really don't matter. It's just how much you can keep trying, yes. I guess. Like um, I, because I always felt like I didn't belong in that school and I had to earn my, like my seat, I had excellent grades. Like I, um, I'm gonna brag here because- Do it, <laughs> this is the right place for it. Average. But uh, like I graduated with a 98% average and I was That's taking amazing. like- That's amazing. And like AP Latin and things like that. Cause I was just like, I have to work so hard. And it was frustrating because I was in classes with kids who like just didn't care. Um, and then they'd go to university and they'd fail university, but then they kept going back and they were like, well, I'm going to try this now. I'm going to try it. Like they, it took them like six years to finish their undergrad mm -hmm. and their parents just kept bankrolling it. And you really see like, oh, for, and those people are doing great now. They're doing amazing because they were just given an unlimited amount of chances. Yeah. And you also see that you don't need to diversify per se. Um, I'm gonna kind of jump topics here. Yes. You, don't, you don't need to have it divided into like, you know how we have the different streams where it's like university, college. Yeah, like right? academic and applied, yeah. yeah. Practically, especially when you're dealing with teenagers, that's gonna be interpreted as like smart, dumb, yes. medium dumb, you know? You don't need to do that. You just need small class sizes so that the teachers can individualize the lessons as much as they can. Because I was going to school and they were class sizes of like 10 people. And they ranged from like super smart to like super, I don't want to say dumb because I don't think anyone's mm -hmm. dumb, but like to people who didn't struggle at all, to people who were really struggling, to people who like didn't care about the material. Mm -hmm. And all 10 of those kids ended up like passing the class or being okay just because they were able to get that attention. And so you look at the way that poor kids are treated in public schools where it's like, let's cram as many of them in, into this, you know, there yeah. are 50 of them in a lab that was built for 20. And then they're like, why is everyone failing? Yeah. <laughs> why are people dropping out? Why is there so much crime? <laughs> If you just treated poor kids the way you treated rich kids, there would be, I mean, there'd still be crime. Rich people mm. still do crime. They For do sure. fancy crimes, like embezzlement, but like, exactly. <laughs> people are always gonna be bad, but if you just treated the poor children the same way you treated the rich children, you would like cut those problems in half. And that mm. is a conservative estimate on my part, I think. Yeah, one, I'm definitely like, there are pieces of growing up poor in an affluent neighborhood that I am grateful for. Like one of them would be that I was held to the same standard as the rich children, mm -hmm. that uh, it was never a question that I would get post-secondary education and that I would go on and yeah. like, you know, uh, it was, it was never a question that, uh, I had to do those things because it was what was expected of everybody around me. Right? Yeah. Where like the rich kids are like, yes, of course I'm going to university mm -hmm. where I feel like if I 
hadn't grown up around people like that, that I would have thought differently about what I was capable of or what life was expected of me. Yeah. But yeah, I love trying to practice gratitude for everything, even the tough stuff. Man, we definitely have to sit down and have a conversation about this, like <laughs> on our own. <laughs> for sure, we definitely do. Mm -hmm. We're getting, if... pardon? I was about to keep going with this tangent, but you were about to bring us back to No, to no, business. go ahead. I was just gonna say, we've got like about eight minutes left. So uh, we're coming towards the end of the time, but we're not on any specific time crunch. Okay. So I was going to say one of the things that really bonded me and my husband, because we're very different. He's, when we met, he was um, like, he's from Australia. He moved here for, to get married to me, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, like very different families, very different backgrounds. But one of the things we really bonded over was that he too um, went to a private school, was like a poor kid going to a private school and that same like sense of alienation and that weird adolescence really, we really bonded over that because it is a really, like, it's just a unique yeah. and bizarre way to grow up. Whenever I make friends with somebody who had that experience, I know that we're going to have a different kind of bond with each other mm -hmm. because yeah. it, it is so unique. Mm -hmm. There was a, again, I, me and my drag queens, but um, in an episode of their web show, uh, Trixie Mattel was talking about uh, like the feeling of shame and mentioned that growing up, you know, he was, he felt shame for like being gay and was so afraid of like being called the F word because that would just mm -hmm. ruin his day. But he also mentioned, and this one didn't get as much um, airtime in the show, but he said like the number one thing he was most ashamed of was being poor and people finding out that he was the poorest kid in his school. Yeah. And that, again, I was like, this is why you're my favorite drag queen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Man, I have, uh, I've actually stolen assignments from Katya, who's the other host. Of that show. <laughs> <laughs> Brenda, Brenda. <laughs> Brenda. Yeah. <laughs> you got to name that voice. It helps mm -hmm. so much. <laughs> yeah. I think mine's gonna be Mavis. I feel like if it's like a oh, that's good. Feeling like a bit of an antiquated name, and also that way I'm not like I'm not gonna meet a Mavis. Yeah. You know? Um, we did an interview with Al Val, and they were saying that they would name there's something that is not a name and is sort of genderless, like clam. And I think mm. that's also great because you're never gonna meet a clam. <laughs> um, and you couldn't take a clam seriously. <laughs> I thought he was going to say something that more like, I love clam. Clam is great. I thought he was be like something like genderless and then say something that sounded kind of demony, like a Beelzebub or like yeah. a, but that would give it <laughs> power. Then it, that would be really intimidating. I don't think I could stand up to a Beelzebub. Yeah. I don't want one of those living in my head all the time. <laughs> I can take a Brenda. <laughs> I think that's about my max level. Yeah. So uh, we end by me giving the guest a genuine compliment. Oh, nice. Do I get yeah. to give you one as well? Um, you're allowed to, but it's not a required part of the format. So if you just want to sit and absorb the compliment that I give you, that's 100% absolutely fine. I never want people to feel like this is the time of the podcast where I make the guests <laughs> say something nice to me. So 100% well, I'm going to do, do it anyway. Um, you're welcome to, but <laughs> it is 100% not an obligation. Also, yeah. I would love I would love a podcast that ends with the host being like, and now it is the time for me to receive my compliments. Yes. <laughs> now say nice things about me. <laughs> <laughs> um, my compliment to you, I just think you're awesome. I like quietly adore you. <laughs> That's I'm such just, a lovely thing to hear. I'm just like such a fan of yours. First of all, I think you're so funny and sharp and uh cutting but not in an off-putting way you just seem to be very good at like uh you observe what's happening and then you can say something really sharp in response to it i i just i think that you have a really brilliant comedic mind that's probably one of the reasons why you are so unbelievably funny on Twitter. Like, I think you are one of the funniest people on Twitter. You're just so good at it. I am terrible at Twitter. You're amazing at it. Um, you also just have this like strength and confidence 
that comes off of you um, that's so authentic. Like um, some people can, you can tell that they kind of like put on a, a confidence veneer or maybe even just specifically for comedy. With you, it, it doesn't seem to be a veneer. It just, it really comes off as you just authentically are this really like strong, commanding, confident woman. And I think that's such a, a beautiful thing about you as a person and something also that your children are so lucky to have in a mother that like to have that kind of role model for them growing up I think like your kids have like just a, an amazing head start just for having you as their mom <laughs> that would be my compliment to you okay well now I feel self-conscious about mine to you because <laughs> yours was so amazing and um <laughs> Okay, I did warn you at the beginning that yeah. I'm very emotional. So that was such a beautiful thing to hear. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You deserve <laughs> to hear that. I'm going to save this podcast and just listen to it over and over again. <laughs> Whenever I feel sad, I'm going to be like, where's Tracy's compliment to me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's yours to keep for, <laughs> for as much as you need to use it. I will also say as someone who has always felt really insecure about their place in like the comedy landscape of the city. That was really, really nice to hear. Thank you so much. Of course. And you're not alone in feeling weird about where you stand in the comedy community. I think like, especially the more that I talk to comedians on this podcast, I'm like, yeah, we all feel exactly the same way. And we're just assuming that we're the only one who feels like that. Uh, every open mic is just us being like, do you guys like me? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so I, I do still want to say my compliment to you, even though it's not going to be as good. You're welcome to it. No <laughs> judgment or scale on these compliments. <laughs> but I just want to say you have, of, of so many people, like, because in comedy you meet so many people every night, but of, of all the people that you meet in comedy, you have such a lovely and generous energy about you just when like when you're talking to everyone like you you're very friendly and personable but it really goes beyond that when you you have such a caring and understanding heart it's so magnetic and it's just really really truly genuinely lovely and i think that everyone who gets to interact with you whether it's like as a friend or just in passing is is so lucky that they get to have a like a bit of that energy that you that you give that's so nice isabel <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna play that over and over for myself when i'm sad <laughs> thank you so much for that you're welcome it's very genuine oh my goodness i really really mean it you're the best and uh to our listeners go be nice to yourself and remember that love is everywhere 